John Connerton, co-managing partner of Bain Capital uh, Private Equity, joins us now on set to, to kind of figure out what's happening in the world right now. John, great to see you. Great to see you on this side of the Thank pond. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I, I think a lot of people are piling into cash because they don't know. They're getting great yields, but they also don't know. There's a huge amount of uncertainty out there right now. So many different narratives whipsawing various asset classes. How are you thinking about how are you navigating this turbulence? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. We've, we've been through 40 years now. We're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. Thank you. Um, and every cycle is different, um, but every cycle has this, this pattern of dislocation. It starts with a credit bubble, which we had in 21, um, and that ends up with valuations being dislocated, people being fearful of where to put their money. Uh, and ultimately, that ends up happening every single time. And mm -hmm. valuations do reset. It takes yeah. a while. Uh, and, Where are we in that process, do you well, think? Well, I think we're, we're getting there. I think part of the challenge has been the capital cycle for credit has been so dislocated for longer um, because rates were so low and price discovery and the banks themselves have been on the sidelines so that the credit markets supporting private transactions have been very expensive, actually way more expensive than the base rate yep. uh, increase. It's really been a very, very high price set of credit returns that those issuers are looking for. And mm -hmm. so what we really need is a stabilization in the credit markets to really have a robust but, recovery in the private equity But what's markets. so weird, John, is that the credit markets feel okay. Like small caps are not, but like the actual spreads are, are contained and they're fine. Um, so we keep waiting for something to break at that point for everything to reset. Well, I would say, first of all, it is resetting. So I, I would say just in the last three or four months, we've seen valuations come down in the private markets. They came down in the public markets very quickly, other than seven stocks. But as it relates to traditional verticals beyond just those seven stocks, uh, we haven't seen that come back into, uh, into focus around valuations that make sense okay. until maybe the last three or four months. Uh, you know, today we announced a deal uh, to exit a business in the industrial distribution business. And it had a regular financing and, and really was a terrific opportunity for both us to seek an exit, but then ultimately another sponsor to buy. Is it, is it harder to exit and easier to buy? Tell us about the environment. I think both are hard in some ways because, uh, again, si seller and buyer expectations are not always aligned. Um, you know, people still have the nostalgia for uh, 2021 valuation levels. They think credit markets are going to get a lot better. I don't think they will. Um, so I think there has been this need for a calibration between buyers and sellers that is just now taking place uh, as people need to sell how wide, is, how wide is that spread still? What's the bid ask right now? Well, I'll give you a sense on the credit market and how that can change things. Just in the last two months, as we were working on a transaction, the credit lenders, the private credit lenders, were actually charging double-digit rates as they do these days. Yep. Uh, but then a bank came in with a commitment and syndication offer that was 200 basis points uh, uh, more, more, uh, uh, more attractive to mm. us. And that allowed for the deal to take place. That difference allowed us to actually transact in a deal that wouldn't otherwise happen. I think that's happening now in the credit markets, which I think will be very healthy for the buyout markets. Hey John, I was taking a look at the portfolio companies um, that you guys own, and a lot of them are going to be small businesses. What are your com portfolio companies saying right now? I mean, Patrick Harker was warning yesterday of small companies getting hit really hard. Um, how are you helping right now? What's going on there? Well, certainly, I think that's one of the things that we have done really well at relative to our resources. We have 300 investment professionals, and we have 120 people inside our company supporting them every day. It really helped during COVID, frankly, when there's a lot of dislocation. And right now, the ability to take advantage of that dislocation, I think, is really attractive to us. Our capital structures are fine. We don't have maturities out for another three or four years. Our credit cap rates on our rates have been very low, back to the 21 levels. So for us, we're generating 10% operating earnings growth across our portfolio, and that's 175 businesses. So we haven't seen the softening. We've seen some here in Europe with some industrial assets. Uh, we're seeing a little bit in the consumer in the U.S., but right now, you know, we're preparing more for that recession as opposed to seeing it. Okay, so do you expect the recession next year? There are some pretty big maturity towns next year that are going to be coming through and hitting the market. I kind of walk me through what you think 2024 does look like. You know, it's hard to predict the exact timing, but I would suspect that, you know, this stimulus uh, that we saw combined with the deficit in the U.S., I mean, people were very surprised at a trillion and a half deficit. I don't yep. think anybody predicted that. That does affect and help the economy. 
that yeah. helps the economy a lot. So that's going to take a while to work through its system. And I think that we're going to see 24, maybe even the latter half of 24, before we see at least the U.S. economy. We're seeing it in, in Europe, yeah. but I think the U.S. economy will take a little bit longer. So the downside of that is, of course, higher for longer um, from the Fed, which then also, like, I I if you have the refi maturity in five years, if it's higher for longer, then in five years you're going to feel the pain. How do you see that part playing out? Well, I don't know. I think that the way markets react to, to rates isn't a, a current market rate. It's actually the forward-looking 10-year rate that often is the index, certainly for refinancing for the long term. And I think that you forget that the businesses that we bought have been growing their earnings 10% per year. So it's not like they couldn't refinance today. It would just be a higher cost of capital. Um, and so I think that really affects more the new transactions, where the new multiples for those transactions have to be just at a, a lower price. Alex earlier asked about, about um, buying and selling. Um, let's talk a little bit more about, uh, about the exit story. EQT was talking earlier on today. They're talking about the fact they are they're a, finding the fundraising environment a little bit more sluggish, but they're talking about novel new ways or a bit more creative ways of looking at exits. How are you thinking about exits right now? What do you think the strategy is going to look like? What kind of exits are we looking at in terms of the format they're going to take? Well, I think that you know the private equity industry in the last five years has been in search of a better uh, market for exit than just financial sponsors and corporate M&A. The IPO market has been open for a long time, but it's really not a great way to sell uh, a public company or a private company into a public context. Because on any given day, with the dislocation we're seeing in the marketplace, yep. it could trade at a very different price than the buyer and seller want to uh, trade at. So this notion of bringing private capital earlier to be anchors in, a, in an offering for, even in that case, a private deal, it makes a lot of sense. We're seeing it with continuation funds. We're seeing it in the secondaries market where people are selling portfolios. And it's all about getting liquidity, but holding on to those private assets for longer. Um, John, quick to the end here. What's the biggest risk? I know it's so simple, but everyone comes on from private equity and says, hey, everything's OK. We're going to manage it. It's going to be tough, but we're OK. And I'm trying to figure out who's going to be left holding the empty milk carton. Well, I think all that spilled milk today is, is largely th short-term thinking. That's why, you know, the good news about private equity is we're, we're, we're consummate op optimists because we look to the long term. And, I, I, you know, the questions around long-term issues I think do remain. I mean, we do have inflationary pressures that aren't going away with energy transition, labor dislocation, you know, the new normal for where globalization is going. So these issues, I think, are, are harder and do make the exit environments tougher. Uh, but I think overall, if we have the long-term orientation, you know, we can manage through those cycles. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the bigger risks are the disruptions from geopolitics that, you know, that take something that is very logical, and we think all logically in private equity, and make them irrational. Thanks for going with my milk thing. I don't know where that came from. John, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Thank you for your time today. Uh, John Connaughton, uh, co-managing partner over at Bain Capital.